Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Maine, Mr. Poliquin, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it very much, and thank you all for being here today. <clears throat> Before I entered Congress a year ago, I was the state treasurer in Maine and a small business owner. I still am a small business owner. And one of the things that we learned, those of us who are business owners, is number one, you live within your means, and number two, you be very, very careful with debt. Now, I'll tell you one of the things that we learned, Mr. Chairman, back in Maine, when I was state treasurer, we actually had a debt clock that was unwinding. I come in here every hearing, and I look at that $19 trillion continuing to spool up, and it makes me sick to my stomach. It makes me sick to my stomach because there aren't enough people, frankly, on the other side of the aisle have the guts to deal with this. They talk about it, but all they want is bigger government, more spending, more debt, which results in higher taxes, and they, of course, want more regulations and higher energy costs, and that kills jobs. And it kills jobs. That's important because our folks don't have jobs. They don't pay taxes. They're more dependent on the government, and we don't have the cash flow to meet our obligations. Now, the reason we were able to unwind our debt clock in Maine during 2011-2012 is because we attacked a fundamental issue dealing with the debt which is our unfunded pension liability, public pension fund. We looked at the eye, we were serious about it, we engaged all stakeholders, and we reduced 41% of that pension debt, which caused the debt clock to unwind. Now, we've got the same problem here, Mr. Chair. We have a $15 trillion unfunded defined benefit pension plan called Social Security. Now, we all know in this room, and the folks that are listening, two-thirds of our budget is on autopilot in four programs, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and interest on the debt, which isn't a program, but it continues to grow. When are we going to have a serious conversation with the kids in this country, 25 and 30-year-old folks, to say, if you want these programs that are growing a lot faster than our tax revenues, we need to make some changes. We know what to do with simple math. Now, I'm not talking about our seniors, Mr. Chair, who have paid into these programs their whole lives and are depending on these programs. No change for them. But we have millennials, and there are a lot of them, a lot more than the baby boomers, and we can fix this. So that's one of the reasons, Mr. Chair, why I support, and I know you do too, and those on this side of the aisle do, a balanced budget amendment of the Constitution. My second day here, I'm still trying to find out where the men's room is. I co-sponsored that bill. I think it would be the greatest institutional tool that Washington could have. Force Washington to live within its mean so we can start paying down our debt. Now, Mr. Chair, when we have Mr. Liu coming in here, the Secretary of the Treasury, telling us, well, the debt's no big deal. It's only 3 4 percent of the GDP. We've talked about it today. You have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The interest payments on that debt are now twice what we spent on veterans benefits in a year. They're projected to exceed what we spend to defend our country in eight years. It is a big deal. Now, I would say also, Mr. Chair, that four years ago, the annual budget deficit was $1.3 trillion. It's now $440 billion. We got a long way to go, but it's been cut in two-thirds. Not because some folks don't want to spend more. It's because that Republicans are trying to be fiscally disciplined and have spending caps in place. So my question to you, Mr. Mitchell, you've been around this town a lot longer than I do have. Do you think we have enough people in Congress to have the guts to address our spending problem that will allow us to start whittling away at that $19 trillion debt that's chewing up our budget and putting a yoke around our kid's neck that they're going to be saddled with that creates a tremendous dark cloud above our economy? and kills jobs, and kills the kids of our future. What do you think? Normally, I'm a pessimist, but for five years in a row, the House has voted for a budget resolution that is based on the assumption of some genuine and serious reform to slow the growth of entitlement spending. And the Senate even did something sort of like that uh, last year. Uh, so I think there is a recognition to some degree that there's a very serious problem. Obviously, that led, you know, th those moves in Congress couldn't go anywhere because of opposition from the White House. Uh, but maybe, just maybe, within a couple of years, we'll, we'll be able to take a serious uh, 
step in terms of preventing America Stone, from becoming Greece. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mitchell. Dr. Stone, what do you think? Do you think we have enough people in Congress on both sides of the aisle? I know we do on this side. Do you think we have enough on the Democrat side who are fiscally disciplined and conservative enough to start getting their act together and start living within our means? What do you think, sir? I, th I think that um, in, in 2010, um, in, the, in 2011, rather, when we had the debt ceiling crisis and, and we, we had a commission, we had a super committee in Congress to try to make decisions, there was a bipartisan failure to come up with a permanent solution. It's hard choices. It, ha it, it takes... We don't need a commission, Mr. Stone. I, I'm not... A no, 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 we no, know no, what no. to do. This is all about politics and simple math. No, the, I don't, I'm not talking about any... I'm not talking about a commission. I'm talking about a committee of Congress. A Mr. super Stone, committee. The, the, the gentleman's time has expired. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Yield back my time, which Thank I you. don't have.